Hello, this is Matthew, and welcome to the second video in our series on the MUMPS programming language, officially now the M programming language. I had mentioned I wanted to do a video on installing the DSM-11, Digital Standard MUMPS 11 operating system on the PDP-11, so I figured that would be a nice uh quick-ish video before we dive into FileMan back on a more modern MUMPS implementation in the third and likely final video in the series. Uh, DSM-11 is quite old, uh, pre-MUMPS language standardization, and missing uh, certainly both language and other convenience features that even the DSM for OpenVMS uh, on VAX that we have available to us has, which is actually quite a nice environment uh, that's that's lacking very little relative to current modern implementations. Uh, but when you are dealing with DSM-11 on your PDP-11 through your virtual serial console, serial terminal device, uh, there is no full screen editor that I've been able to find. Uh, it appears the editors, uh, there's a very primitive line editor, and then there is a slightly less primitive line editor, which was you know probably considered the really advanced editor at the time. So if you're really wanting to dive into mumps and write some mumps code, uh, I would not recommend doing that on the PDP-11 DSM-11 version. Uh, there are much, much better options available to us today. But if you're in this like me, just for the fun hobbyist historical aspect, and you just want to run DSM-11 as an operating system on your PDP-11 for the fun of it, then I highly encourage you to do so because, again, this is pretty significant uh, in its time, old software, and it's really cool to be able to keep it alive and use it today. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, this system I'm on DAX, by the way, this is the Power9 server that I unboxed a few videos back. So we can see the machine type here. Yep, PPC64, Little Indian. So this server is now out at a data center. Uh, so I have good, uh, reliable power connectivity. It sits out there. So I have anything I just want to run full time and not worry about it. Uh, it's really cool having that nice, reliable system out there that I can play with. And I have a few friends who are interested in alternative architectures and open source software development who really care about uh, making sure that they're writing portable software that works correctly on a number of architectures. So I've been able to provide them accounts on this box as well. And it's uh, just become a nice little uh, sort of community tool for a, a little group of hackers and programmers I'm in uh, to be able to have some nice IBM Power9 hardware out there. Uh, running Debian Linux, of course, because that is the Linux distribution I run for servers, uh, Debian stable. So I figured, why not, for the purposes of this video, um, use that Power9 system just because it sort of adds to the overall theme of my channel here. <laughs> so, of course, the first thing we need is our PDP-11. Uh, so I'm going to make a directory just to hold our whole DSM-11 experiment here. And to get a PDP-11, we need to either go to eBay and find one, <laughs> good luck, uh, or know somebody in the hobbyist or collector community that is looking to rehome uh, his or her PDP-11 and get that safely transferred and up and running to your house, or use a simulator. So that's what we're going to do for the purposes of this video. We are going to grab OpenSimH. So go to the web browser here. Uh, if you just search for OpenSimH, of course, uh, that's probably the quickest, easiest way to find their GitHub repository. Um, but we will go OpenSimH. We can clone that repository. Let's go back to the terminal, git clone that URL. And that should come down pretty quickly here. Great, so if we go into SimH, all we need to do is type make and then the simulator we want to build, which in this case, we only want the PDP-11 simulator. So I'll run that. It will probably list some various optional prerequisites for various types of network support and some other things, graphics support. You don't need any of this for DSM-11 on the PDP-11. 
while this version of DSM-11 does appear to recognize the Ethernet uh, interface in the PDP-11 that SimH PDP-11 simulates, uh, I don't think there's anything particularly useful you can do with it. There's certainly no IP stack or anything like that in DSM-11. I don't think it even has any kind of real DECnet stack either. Um, when I was playing with it earlier during the setup process, it looks like there may be some way to connect multiple DSM-11 installs together over the network. I don't know what capabilities that provides. Um, like I said, I, I don't know how to set it up and I haven't looked into it. There's essentially no surviving documentation that I've been able to find on the internet for DSM-11. We're very lucky that, uh, that whoever recovered this tape was even able to get the tape and post it online so that it's now been archived by BitSavers and on some other sites. Um, but the documentation has not resurfaced. So if anyone out there has any old PDP-11, uh, DSM-11 manuals, it would be really, really cool to get those scanned and online, especially now that we have the software. So anyway, uh, let's see. In the bin directory, that's where SimH um, builds the software. We now have a PDP-11 binary. So I'm going to go back up a level, and I'm just going to move that SimH bin PDP-11 into my DSM-11 directory here. So there's my PDP-11. We also need the installation tape. So back over to the web browser, if I search for for DSM-11 on BitSavers, we will see among the top links, the BitSavers um, bits archive here for DSM-11, and we need the DSM image.tape. So this is the installation tape. So I'm gonna copy that URL, I'm gonna go back to the terminal, and I'll just download that with curl. And if we look now, once again, you can see, sure enough, we have the DSM image dot tape. Now it is pretty much just a simple matter of running the PDP 11 emulator and you can attach to its uh, existing default tape drive, that tape image, and then you'd be able to attach uh, I believe RL0 is the disk device we can use, and we can call it just DSM11. Maybe DSK. So that'll create the new disk file. Um, I'm not sure what overwriting the last track does, but sure, we'll overwrite the last track. So now I have a PDP11 in just kind of the default SimH configuration with the tape inserted or mounted into the tape drive and the uh, new empty hard drive here on RL0. So if I show conf, you can see that we are a, scroll all the way back up, we're a uh, PDP-1173, we have 256 kilobytes of RAM. How could you ever fill 256K of RAM? Uh, those IBM PCs with the 640K were just wasteful. Can you imagine how much bloat there must have been in DOS? <laughs> Uh, but anyway, our uh, what we see here is that there are a ton of devices, um, various disk uh, interfaces, hard drive interfaces, and uh, some other things that, while not harmful in any way, are unnecessary. Uh, yeah, a couple different kinds of tapes. Um, here's that Ethernet interface that, again, I don't know what, if anything, we can actually do with under DSM-11. So given our constrained resources of 256K, and given that part of the installation process of DSM-11 uh, is going to, we're just going to have it do an automatic hardware configuration for the sysgen. And in a, in a restricted environment, every little, uh, you know, probably device entry in the operating system kernel or the nucleus that we don't actually need is probably taking up a small amount of storage that perhaps we do need. So instead of just using the default SimH config here, uh, I'm actually going to quit and copy in a file that I prepared ahead of time called pdp11.dot 
Oh, actually, I didn't prepare it ahead of time on this system. Uh, so let's do this the hard way, which is to do, let's do PDP 11 again. And if we show conf, I'm going to start writing down um, just in notes over to the side some things that we probably don't need. So these kinds of things like the clock and our basic terminal input output, of course, we do need. We'll leave enabled. We will leave a printer enabled. Um, I suspect if we attach that to a file, we'll then be able to get information out of the DSM-11 system to that file on our host. Um, by just printing to it. So that could be another way to back up routines that you write is maybe just print them out to the printer device. DZ is our serial multiplexer. We will be connecting serial terminals to the machine, so we'll leave that enabled. Um, but we don't need to use any RK type disks. Um, RL will be the hard drives we use. We don't need any HKs, uh, whatever. I don't think we need an RX. I don't think we need an RP. I don't think we need an RQ. It may tell us that we can't turn one of these off because it's actually the bus that other hard drives are connected to. Uh, TM is the tape drive type we'll use, but that means we don't need TQ, which is another tape. Um, we don't need the Ethernet interface, XQ, and we don't need these ROM units. Um, to load anything from if you had any programs on some kind of read-only uh, media. So let me do a quick test run in SimH interactively. So we can set RK disable, set HK disable, um, set RX disable, set RP disable, set RQ disable, set ROM disable, set XQ disable, and last but not least, set TQ disable. So let me just copy all of that to my clipboard. And now if we show conf, that's looking like a nice system here with our sort of core devices. And then we just have our serial multiplexer, our hard disk bus, with or the RL type uh, hard disks, the TM type tape, and that's it. So to automate that, let's just exit. I can make a file called uh, pdp11.ini. I'll paste all of that in, and we just want to get rid of that simh prompt. So we can just do a global um, search and replace of simh space with nothing. That's probably some, sp or not simh, sim. There we go. And then we can attach our disk image, so what did I call it? It doesn't really matter, dsm11.disk. Uh, so that will always attach the hard drive on startup. Save that file. Grab the file name of our tape image here really quick. Um, I don't know if I use the same disk name or not. Let's do PDP11. So now when I run PDP11, uh, SimH simulators will always uh, automatically run whatever commands are in a .ini file that is the same name as the simulator binary. So I could call it something else if I want to specify it or not have it automatically run. Um, but in this case, I just want it to automatically run. So you name it the same as the simulator. And once it loads, now if you do the show comp, you can confirm that yes, we just have our tape drive, our disk drive, our serial multiplexer, our printer, and then the uh, the important devices. So the hard drive is already attached. We will mount the tape into that uh, tape device. So I can say attach to TM the tape image name. And that looks good. And then all we need to do is boot from the tape. So boot TM. And you can see we are booting DSM-11 version 3.3 baseline system, and it drops you into the installation procedure. So it does have some built-in help, uh, but we'll start with today's date. You'll notice it only takes two digits, and it is not year 2000 uh, aware or compliant. So I'm going to tell it, uh, let's see, it's October 15th still here. So I'll say 15 October 
And then 1989 had the same calendar as uh, the current year, 2023. So I'll say it's the 15th of October, 1989. And then when we actually get into the system, we'll see that it correctly identifies that as Sunday, which is what today still is at time of recording. Uh, and then the time, uh, we are able to use the real time. So it is currently 23. In fact, it's just turning 2307. So I'll just do 230700. And then which disk do we want to install on? So I'm going to hit a question mark here, and it will list the uh, available disks that it detected. So it detected my RL type controller, and it has designated the first disk in the RL controller to be device DL0. So that's the only hard drive I actually have, so we will install onto DL0. It's asking if I want to run a comprehensive test for bad blocks. So it will create a, a bad block map of the disk by actually writing test patterns to every uh, sector of the disk, reading them back, making sure they're good, and it can do several patterns. Um, so of course I can hit no here because the SimH disk is not going to have any bad blocks, uh, but it's interesting to hit yes, and then it will actually ask you which test patterns you want to use. So you can pick and choose. The various test patterns that are designed to pick up different types of errors and you can see that i'm you know i imagine on a real uh rl disk on a real pdp 11 this process probably took quite a long time but of course on my simulated disk sitting on top of a uh, zfs file system backed by several uh, several spindles on a modern power 9 server that went quite quickly. On my desktop machine with SSDs, this all actually goes pretty instantly. Nonetheless, it didn't find any bad blocks. Uh, you can manually enter any bad blocks that you're aware of outside of maybe what it detected, but of course, we don't need to do that either. So now it wants a label for the disk, up to 22 characters enclosed in quotes. So this is just going to be my system disk maybe, so I'll just put quotes system. And then what three character uppercase name do you wish to give this volume set? So volume sets are one of the abstractions that Mumps uses when you're uh, optimizing things and you can actually say, okay, which globals, so those are the, the database variables basically, the, the variables and hierarchies that are stored in the database um, should be directed to which volume sets and then you can further specify how the indexes are created, all that. We don't need to worry about that. Uh, we're just going to call this volume set sys, and that'll be the only volume set in our system. I don't think we have a need to add more disks um, to create additional volume sets in our simulated system here. So you can see it's loading in all of the system routines and creating some system globals. Uh, so a lot of the system's configuration itself is actually stored in the mumps database in globals. Uh, you can see that the help system appears to be stored there. Uh, there's a whole little menu system that there are, are the vendor provided routines here. Um, you'll see some stuff up here to list the menus and to, to run menus. Uh, so you can actually use the built-in menuing system to build your own menus if you wanna use that as a front end for an application you build. You don't necessarily need to build your own menu system. Um, so that's all loaded in there, and it says it's copying the system image, it's making the disk bootable, and that DL0 is now a bootable DSM-11 system disk. So we're done with the tape, and it's asking if we're ready to proceed directly to sysgen. So yes, we will perform our sysgen here. Extended help can explain more. You can always hit question mark if you need to know more, so I'm just going to accept the default of no for extended help. You can have multiple configuration identifiers. So when you boot the system, it will ask you uh, if you want to just boot the default config or you'd be able to choose the different config. So this can be a good way if you want to test some changes. Uh, again, some of this can have to do with optimizing memory usage and you might need to tune things for performance. Um, you might set up terminals differently, uh, right? If you have 40 terminals, uh, you may change which terminals are attached to which applications. And so you can have alternate config sets instead of just the one. 
But um, you can call them anything. We'll call this one just the number one, as it suggests the default is. And then do you have to auto configure the current system? Yes, we will auto configure. So this is going to detect all the hardware and it will create the appropriate device blocks uh, for whatever hardware this system has that is supported. And what's interesting is this, uh, the, the type of tape device that we used for the install actually isn't supported by DSM-11 once it's installed. <laughs> so if you do want to back things up to tape, um, you'd probably re-enable that TQ tape device instead of the TM tape device that we're using. And that TQ tape device is supported. Um, so perhaps I should have left it enabled so that the system generation here would actually find it and configure the system for it. But uh, that's neither here nor there. You can try that when you're going through your installation. All right, so the important thing, here's all of the, um, basically the four different channels, each which has eight lines of the serial multiplexer. So that's how all of our terminals will connect to it. And the hard drive, of course, it found, and then the, uh, the printer. So do I wish to modify this configuration? No. Standard software options, yes. Uh, it's telling me some various, uh, actually it's scrolled through quite a bit of stuff that it automatically configured because I just said auto configure and standard software. Um, but you can essentially see here. So device number three is our printer. So you'll see in a lot of cases, um, the system utilities will ask, oh, what do you want your output device to be? In this case, if you want it to print to the printer, you can choose device number three. You can see we get some various software. The default software options don't include spooling support. So if you did, uh, if you answered no to default, you'd be able to include that. Um, map routines, loadable user driver space not included. So again, I suspect these were less often used advanced features. And so they're not enabled in that default feature set when you just say yes to the defaults. And uh, yeah, total system exec size is gonna be 71. Uh, almost 72k out of my 256k uh, of storage that this machine has. So memory allocation parameters, uh, space allocated for various system data structures. Again, uh, are up to a total of seven mountable database volume sets. So again, these are things that you would tune to your system based on your amount of memory, based on your application's needs. Um, journaling. So again, from the start, Mumps uh, was relatively reliable in the fact that it had journaling support for your databases. Uh, so a system crash was usually recoverable up to the last successful transaction. And uh, yeah, just more information that it has auto configured for us that if you were so inclined, you could have said no and uh, done a manual configuration of all of this. Uh, application interrupt key is configurable. Control C, programmer abort, control Y. Those may be good to know. Um, this is actually interesting, whether you want it to echo the login. So if somebody's looking over my shoulder, they can currently see the programmer access code, which is like a little three letter password to get into programmer mode. Um, this is an interesting option. Number of significant digits for division. Cool. Uh, and now it's asking, is the line frequency 60 Hertz? Uh, so again, this was just using the power line frequency as part of its timekeeping. So we'll say yes there. Uh, I don't think SimH particularly simulates that one way or the other. I, I don't think if you're in a 50 hertz region, if you answer you know yes or no here, it makes any difference. But there you go. And this programmer access code. So this is the, like I said, kind of password to let you get into programmer mode. Um, three letters. Case sensitive. So this is one of those places where you know it could be lowercase a. Uh, uppercase B, lowercase C. I think I'll set it to that. A, B, C, capital B. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then initials. Uh, anytime you do a system uh, setup change, I think it logs it somewhere. So this is just the initial installation. Okay. Do you stream in baseline mode? No. We will go ahead and start up that configuration that we just defined. So we're starting configuration one. Uh, we don't want, well, we want all the defaults here, but again, more 
more stuff that you can define to be uh, when the system starts up in configuration one, do you want it to do these things? And we made this startup file, the configuration for configuration one. Okay, so it is starting up our real installed configuration. You can see DSM 11 version 3 by 3. Um, I think this one is the configuration name. So if I had called this, you know, my config, I think it'd say DSM version 3.3 .3, my config is now up and running. If you hit enter, you'll get the login prompt here. Uh, so there is a uh, UCI, or I think it's user class indicator, something like that. Uh, for manager and that is where all the system management routines are and then the programmer mode access code uh, we set to a capital b lowercase c and we are in there's that mumps prompt that we saw um, throughout the last video so here's where i can say things like write hello and that's it so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call a global routine called SSD, that system shutdown. So this is how you shut down your system. Do caret SSD. I hit enter there. It's telling me one job is logged in. It has disabled logins. So if I have other terminals, they can no longer log in as soon as I call this routine. Um, I can see who is still logged in. It's just one job. So I assume that's me. Then I can perform a timed shutdown or an immediate shutdown. So I'll just perform an immediate shutdown. It might ask if you're sure, um, particularly if there's this background care caretaker uh, job, if it's woken up and doing something, uh, then there's more than just you logged in. And so it'll confirm that you actually want to kill other things. But in this case, it just says ready to halt. So I'll do control E, which is the SimH uh, escape command. And then we can exit out of SimH. So the th last thing, not PHP, PDP, generally the way that I connect to the system is through that uh, simulated serial multiplexer. So in SimH, I can attach, uh, that was what, DZ, and this just takes a port. So let's say port 4,000. So we'll save that. We'll start. In fact, let me start a screen session so that we can switch terminals here. So I'll start up my PDP 11. Uh, you can see now that uh, SimH is listening on port 4,000 um, because we've attached the DZ serial ports to port 4,000. So if I tell it to port 4,000, I'll get connected to basically DZ0, uh, the first port of DZ. If I then open another session and tell it to port 4000, I'll get plugged into the second serial port on this serial multiplexer. And there is a way to split, uh, to have different ports for different lines of the DZ controller. Um, I was looking in some of the online documentation for SimH and couldn't find it. So I asked in one of the Discord channels and uh, somebody quickly pointed out that, uh, yeah, if you just get help for the DZ device here in SimH, um, it goes into detail on how you can connect individual lines to different ports. So uh, if you wanted to be able to connect into a particular line, which could be important for something like DSM 11, because I might assign particular terminal lines to run particular applications, uh, you're able to do all that with SimH by just telnetting into a, a different port. Um, so that's all there in the SimH help if you just do help. Uh, DZ. But uh, we don't need to do that right now. We will just boot from that RL0 hard drive where we installed DSM, and you can see it's starting up. Um, so there's no persistent real-time clock on uh, the PDP-11, or at least not this PDP-11. So it remembers the date that it was shut down um, because it, I think, just you know, wrote it into the database. So if I were to start this up a couple days from now, it would still be prompting me for an incorrect old date. Um, but in fact, today is still the 15th of October. So I'll just accept the default. And because we used 1989, the calendar is correct uh, for 2023. And it is indeed Sunday. So I'll accept that default. 
Uh, one thing to be aware of if you are typing Y and N in a lot of places in DSM 11 for these confirmation prompts, it is case sensitive. So you often do need to use a capital Y or a capital N. Um, the time now is 23, 21, let's call it 40, which is 11, 21 PM in the evening. Uh, I guess it's just making sure that you did your 24 hour clock math correctly. And then here's where it's asking if you want to start up the default system, which is currently defined to be that configuration we named one. Um, so you can hit yes here. Obviously, if something is dramatically wrong with your system or if you needed to uh, want to start up a different startup config that you had, different environment you had, you could answer no there and uh, either land in baseline mode, which is basically just a purely in-memory uh, basic mumps implementation. Uh, without mounting your volume sets or anything like that so that you could maybe rescue your system get it back to a state where you have a working configuration or pick one of your other configurations As you can see it mounted uh, that sys volume set that we defined uh, it's telling us a little bit about volume one of sys is on dl0 and it has a total of 4800 blocks 3260 which are available so the whole volume set uh, of course is just that one disk so you can add additional disks to existing volume sets and then you can also create entirely new volume sets with their own disks uh, so again that just gets into as your system and applications grow data organization and whatever your needs may be there okay so it's up and running uh, so again if i hit enter we can get back in uh, to the manager uci with that uh, uh, lowercase a uppercase b lowercase c password um, you know, this is very old when I, you know, do a letter and I hit a backspace. Uh, this is sort of designed for just, you know, line uh, teletype printers. So hitting backspace can't actually go back over top of the character it's erasing. It just tells me by echoing out backslash T means that I have backspaced back to that letter, right? So if I say one, two, three, four, five, as I backspace, it's telling me which character I'm at. So if I now type eight, uh, right, I now essentially got uh, one, two, eight in my buffer here, which of course isn't a real command, but you can actually see that it did in fact echo back just the one, two, eight, because after backspacing, that's what I had. So I'm gonna log out of this interface or halt that process. Uh, and I'm going to make a new screen uh, terminal here. And now if we telnet localhost to port uh, 4000 is the one that we told SimH to attach the serial controller to. Yep, so we're connected to the PDP-11 simulator DZ device line zero. Again, if I do control uh, AC to make another new screen session and telnet localhost 4000 again, we're connected to DZ line one. So that'll just, you know, fill up those slots until I um, run out of configured lines in my serial multiplexer. So you can go back to line zero. Uh, so you just hit enter here to get the system's attention and get that same login prompt. We can go in as manager A, B, C. Um, you'll note if I exit out of here, if I do just MGR, whoops, just MGR, it's just telling me there's a syntax error. Um, so you can't just log in as a UCI name. You have to put something else on it. And actually what you're doing here after the colon is you're telling it the routine name to run. So instead of this programmer mode, if I had a routine called, uh, well, actually I do have a routine called sys. I don't know if this will work. Yeah, it does. It drops me directly into the system utilities routine. So that's the same as if I get out of this. Now it logs me out because that routine is over. Um, but if I were to say MGR colon and then the programmer access code, that's basically just a secret routine name that drops you right here into the programmer prompt. So from here, I can say do that same routine, sys, and that drops me into that system utilities routine. But this time I'm back to programmer mode when it's done. Um, there's another piece of syntax for logging in here to select different 
I think there's a way to sort of subdivide the namespaces or something. Um, I'd have to go back and look and play around with that more. Um, but there was another optional piece that you're able to use when you're logging in here. But the important ones are the UCI, uh, which again are sort of the different sandboxes or the different namespaces where you can have uh, your globals and your routines stored and then the routine that you want to launch or your programmer access code when you just want to get to the interactive uh, direct programmer mode prompt. So as you sort of saw here, there is in fact a routine in the manager namespace called sys. Um, so if you saw my last video on sort of the whirlwind tour of mumps, the caret means that you're running something in uh, sort of the global name or the it's a global um, so this is something that persists between my logins here if i had a routine that i made uh, in fact we can show that right now you can make a routine by saying uh, a label and then a tab and then i'll just give a comment here so if semicolon at the end of the lines a comment character i'll say hi and then the lines in that routine are indented with a tab under the routine label and i can say write hello world um, and you can do Z print, and that'll just print out your current routine buffer. So you can see that, yep, that actually is there. So I can do say hello, and of course it says hello. But if I uh, log off, then I halt, and I come back in as MGRABC. If I do say hello, of course say hello was gone because that was just a local thing in my process. Versus if I do that again. I'll do say hello, um, say hi. Well, I, you get the idea. And then I write hello world. And of course, I can now do say hello, but I can also do Z save say hello. And it will save the routine in my routine buffer to the actual routine database under this name, say hello. So now, if I halt my session and I come back in as MGR, uh, oh, and the reason I switched over to the DZ, the virtual serial device, is because this does support backspace, unlike the system console. Uh, so it's much nicer to work with. So MGR, A, B, C. The UCI is not case sensitive, but again, the programmer access code, because it's effectively a routine name, is case sensitive, and routine names are case sensitive. Uh, now, of course, if I do say hello again, it's not in my routine buffer, but because I saved it to the database in the database, so it's a global, effectively, globals are actually technically just the data variables, but um, I can do caret say hello, and you can see here that I have hello world. There is a global directory. Uh, utility so that's percent uh the global directory or the routine directory and i'll talk about this percent in a second so let me do this routine directory and that prints out all of the routines in this uci or again in this uh namespace called mgr the system manager and you can see here that several of them start with a percent and then several of them don't. Somewhere in here should be my, there it is, say hello. Uh, so that is now safely saved as a routine uh, available in this namespace. And so this is a good discovery tool, especially in the system namespace, because you can see these percent routines are actually available to be called from all namespaces, all UCIs, and I'll show you that in a minute. But then without even having documentation for the system, you can sort of see that it's like, oh, there's this thing called sys available and sysgen and sysdef. Uh, and it turns out this routine called sys, so we saw a preview of this earlier, but if I do, uh, and again, d is short for the do command, which is how you uh, call routines. So do caret sys, S-Y-S, that brings me into this menu for system utilities. 
Uh, and some of these, you can say, oh, if I wanted to go directly to system definition, I could have just directly called sysdef, which was another one of these routines that we saw. Uh, and I'm guessing under sysdef, there's a sysgen option. Um, the ones that don't have a routine name are sub menus. Um, and so, right, if I go disk maintenance number three, uh, here's where it looks like I'm able to back up. I'm able to update that bad block stuff. I can format new disks. Uh, so again, I, I imagine if I attached another disk to the PDP 11, uh, I would start by coming into the disk maintenance utility, or I would just know the direct routine I can call uh, to start initializing that disk and then maybe mount it on my system. Typically, you can just hit enter to return to a higher level menu. Uh, another convention in a lot of uh, mump systems is that just the caret, so the up arrow by itself, will uh, exit you out of whatever you're in. So if you're filling out a form and you're like, oh, wait, I just want to cancel this, uh, caret will often do the trick. But one of the things we can do here, if we go into system definition, this is where you can do things like that tied terminal table, where once you have some applications or routines set up, uh, you can tie particular lines of your serial multiplexer to those routines. And so that's where it might be important for you to reconfigure your SimH to have different ports that you can tell net to, to connect to different subsets of your uh, serial lines. But globals and UCIs. So let's go into globals and UCIs. Here's where I can add additional UCIs. Uh, you can also control global placement. So uh, again, if you have those global names or your variables, uh, the top level name, right? So if I were to, you know, when I do write something, users and Wilson, and then whatever else, however many levels deep, uh, you know, equals something, this top level name, users, is the global. So if I know that users is a particularly, you know, it's going to be a particularly big uh, database table isn't the right word, but it's easiest to think of that way, right? Users could be a particularly big database table or global, or maybe it has different performance needs. Maybe I need the fastest lookups from this. And so I want to dedicate, uh, you know, the most expensive, latest and greatest fast type of disk pack for my PDP 11 uh, to storing that global, uh, you're able to control the placement sort of at the global level of where these things end up and then where the default globals, if you don't specifically place them, end up. So in a you know large production system that's managing a lot of data uh, or has various performance needs for transactions that are happening in different parts of your application, there was certainly a lot of customization and tuning that the system administrator uh, system programmers were able to do here to control how their system worked and where all their data ended up. So if we look at the UCI list, you can see that right now we just have UCI number one, which is the system manager UCI. I'm going to add a new one and we are going to call this dev. So maybe we'll have your developer playground where you develop and test routines, and then you could have a PRD, right? A production UCI uh, just right here on the same PDP 11, where after something is tested and ready to be released from dev, you copy the uh, newly developed routines or new versions of the routines over into your production UCI and your terminals out, you know, on the on the factory floor or the office floor um, or the the library or your public card catalog terminals would be defined to be tied to the application in the production UCI and the uh, the terminals back, uh, you know, um, in the staff only area would be tied to your dev UCI, stuff like that. And again, these UCIs are really the namespaces for all of those globals and routines. Uh, so you can use the same global name in different UCIs and they refer to different data. Uh, now, again, placement of where the directory is and the routine directory and the growth areas on disk. I would have to find and read documentation about this. Um, you can see here it's disk type, unit number, map number, block number within the map. Um, so that's the, the format, the syntax of these strings. Luckily, if you just keep hitting the enter key here, it will fill in some defaults. 
Now, I don't know if these are good defaults or if they are bad defaults. <laughs> um, it looks like maybe I'm only leaving one block for the new global's pointer area. And then, right, it's only one block to where the routine directory is. Um, I, maybe these then, I think these look like they translated to maybe absolute block numbers on that device rather than just these map number indirections. So I don't know what any of this really means, but um, I've just been creating new UCIs by hitting enter, and I haven't really tried to put enough data into it yet where it has been a problem. Um, I don't even know how big one of these blocks is. So when you're done, you have nothing left to enter. You just hit uh, enter on a blank line, and it said that it has added my one new UCI. Hit enter again. We're back here. So now if I hit enter to get all the way back out, if I halt, so that gets me out. Now I'm able to do a different UCI. I created that dev UCI. The programmer access code is the same. That's just universal across the whole system. So again, it's not a particularly strong security measure, um, but that's just how you get into programmer mode here. Uh, and this is why it would be important, of course, to have any publicly accessible terminals uh, tied to particular routines that launch applications and um, don't let users just log in blindly or you know type in whatever they want to try and log in. We're now in this dev space. So now if I look at that routine directory again, there are zero routines. But clearly there must be at least this RD routine because I just successfully ran this RD routine, right? If I try and run that sys routine, because hey, I knew that that sys routine existed as well, it says, oh, nope, there's no program called sys. So these percent routines are special. Routines in the manager UCI, so MGR, that start with a percent are available to be called from all UCIs, so all namespaces. So these percent routines are basically the useful enough routines that need to be available to all developers in every UCI. Um, so we essentially get read-only access to any routine in the manager UCI from all of the other UCIs. And there's one there called percent lib, which are library utilities. And so again, these are useful things for the developers who are working in their particular UCI. Um, so if you go editors, you can see that there's the percent editor. Uh, this is a very primitive line editor. Uh, and then there's also the percent EDI editor, which is still a line editor, but it is a little nicer than just the basic original percent editor. Uh, and then the global editor actually lets you go in and see uh, your globals, which I don't really have any in this namespace yet. Uh, star D for directory list, do I want some more examples? No, star D. Uh, oh, so there is actually a utility global in here. I don't need to type the... So it just tells me that that's there. It looks like there's syntax here to look at what's under it. Uh, but again, useful if you're a developer in your in your little namespace sandbox here, um, and you want to look at those things. The just hit enter to get out of it. If I hit two to learn about the EDI editor, it tells me that to create a new program, I type zr and then I execute. Um, execute is a little bit different than do. Uh, X actually evaluates what's in this global variable, whereas do executes a routine. Uh, so for whatever reason, they have the editor set up as actually a little bit of code that needs to be set up and um, executed to actually launch the editor, probably copying whatever's in your routine buffer into some special area that the editor has access to. I don't know, but that's why we look at the help. It tells you, oh yeah, here's how it works. Um, to edit the existing program, so like we did Z save to save a routine into the real uh, routine directory, you use Z load to get a routine back from the routine directory, back from the database into your local routine buffer, and then you're able to edit it. And the editor itself has help. Uh, and here's some commands. So again, it's line oriented. So you go to the top, you go to the bottom, you kill lines, um, you can delete lines, you can add a line, that sort of thing. 
and the escape key does some things and carriage return does some things so we'll just get out of that so that's uh the editor here's where you can get minimax if you don't remember what the global directory is um, you can use the menu system through this lib menu to look at your directory efficiency will start telling you about index efficiency of your globals again we don't really have any yet um can i type a uh yeah partial global name can i just do star here okay yeah i, I really don't have any actual um globals that this thing can see yet so anyway oh it actually did give me a little bit of information uh oh oh okay so sorry it doesn't immediately do it this is just adding so when i did star it did actually select the carrot global utility and you keep adding globals to the list that you want to see and then you just hit enter when you're done and then it shows me the statistics for uh, all of the globals that i selected so yeah that's how that works so it tells me where it is on disk um, bottom pointer data level whatever all these things mean okay what does extended directory do uh, so device output this is where if i hit three it might print but zero is always your current terminal um, so this actually gives me a little bit more information about those globals that's kind of cool um, index collating type uh, first block and it looks like there is actually ability to do some kind of protection on it so that might be something to investigate um, uh, some degree of maybe this would allow for cross UCI if you fully specify a name I don't know if that's even possible um, so yeah things to play around in here uh, basically remember the way I got to that is as a basically developer in any UCI you can do caret percent lib to get into that library utilities menu and then when you're in the manager MGR UCI you can do do caret sys sys no percent because that's just uh, available in the manager to get the system-wide management i think that's about it you're up and running with dsm uh again if i halt here and go back to my actual simh terminal here we can log back in as uh, not sys but mgr colon and then abc was my programmer access code uh again if i do caret sys that's one way i can eventually find my way into is it system how do i shut it down somewhere in the menu here you find the system shutdown uh ah system routines miscellaneous yeah okay so system routines miscellaneous uh system shutdown so here i can do uh, 11 but again i can always just directly say do caret ssd from this manager uci and that's how i shut down the system cleanly um, so again i can say uh, terminate and shut down immediately so here we go it's saying do you want to terminate even though these jobs will be killed i have 10 seconds to answer so i'll just hit enter for the default of yes it shuts down caretaker uh, it says the system's ready to halt so again here's where i can hit control e and actually power off my pdp 11 by exiting simh so that's dsm 11. Um, if you find some dsm for open vms documentation uh, which there are some books in the deck book format on some of the uh, actually alpha uh, and vax documentation cds that are out there on vaxhaven or archive.org you might have to look through a couple um, but if you have the ability to read those deck uh, book formats uh, you'll be able to read the dsm for open vms documentation and while stuff like the system generation and you know obviously the things about this being an operating system versus just being a programming environment an application runtime environment on uh, on vms uh, there is good overlap because the dsm for vms is an evolution a newer version of this dsm 11 for pdp 11. so of course there will be a lot of features and uh, you know newer mumps commands and intrinsics and behavior that uh, were not part of dsm 11 
but uh, it is useful because uh, some of the vendor extensions, so any mumps command that starts with Z and any intrinsic functions and intrinsic variables that start with Z, um, that's sort of the vendor reserved namespace, so not part of the mumps standard. Um, so things like saving routines to the database is not part of the M standard. The M standard says that you know there are routines and there are global routines, but how a particular implementation lets you put those into the routine directory uh, is an implementation detail. So the Z load, Z save thing is kind of common uh, amongst some of them. Um, like we're talking about with Yada DB, a you know modern runs on Unix open source implementation. Um, there are actually files in the file system, so you can edit them that way. When you're on DSM for OpenVMS, you can, instead of just doing the plain percent line editor, you can do EDT and it'll actually pop open, uh, you know, VMS's uh, TPU or Eve or, or EDT, whatever you have set up on your system. So you can get full screen editing of routines, which is, of course, much nicer than using a line editor. Um, but uh, anyway, what was I saying? At the same time, there is still a lot of relevant information in the DSM for OpenVMS documentation that applies, uh, particularly more from the developer perspective and a little bit the system manager perspective um, to DSM 11 here for the PDP 11. So I hope that was fun. Uh, if you want to dive into mumps in the most uh, sort of old original way, <laughs> you can certainly install DSM 11 on a PDP 11 and do it that way. Uh, if you just want to play with the mumps language on your own, go back and check out how to install uh, the the uh, reference standard M uh, just under Linux on your local system. Uh, to to have a bit more of an ergonomic way to play with mumps and learn the mumps language or the M language, if that's what you're interested in. But it's fun to get these old operating systems up and running, especially when it's such a specific purpose operating system like this, whose entire purpose is to run nothing but a mumps environment on your whole PDP-11. Um, so I'm really glad that, that this tape surfaced and uh, someone was able to do that initial work to get just that basic documentation in place to let other people like me know how to install it. Uh, and then once it's installed, it's up to us to sort of explore and figure out uh, because, like I said, I have not been able to find any specific DSM-11 documentation anywhere online. Um, so hopefully those books are in somebody's collection someday and they get scanned in and just magically show up on BitSaver someday. If you know anyone who might have connections that might have them, uh, please do what you can to, to try and get those out there because even cooler than having the software available to us to play with from this era would be if we have a complete set of documentation for it or at least a very um, similar version of it that uh, that covers more of sort of the uh system generation and system definition options and you know how really to deal with new disks and backups to tape and all of that um, what all of that that uci layout stuff actually means um to a bit of that may be in the dsm documentation for vms because again you can lay out within volume sets you define volume sets in that case though are backed by files on your um you know your disks that are on vms not whole disk packs dedicated just to the operating system like this but um yeah interesting things to play with here so thanks for watching we'll be back next time with a video on the file man component of uh, vista which we will be running in a more modern uh, mumps implementation but that'll be our look really from the application side of uh really just how comprehensive and powerful of a database management system has been built on top of the primitives that are offered by the mumps environment itself so have fun with your very own dsm 11 on pdp 11 and i will see you in the next video